What's up, everyone? Welcome back to Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Episode 24, we are doing our first really solo movie episode, and deservedly so, we chose to do Goodfellas. Yeah, we figured we wanted to do an episode featuring one film, and this is uh, probably one of the top of our list. Directed in 1990 by the GOAT himself, Martin Scorsese, based on the book Wise Guy, Life in a Mafia Family by Nicholas Pileggi, who co-wrote the script with Martin Scorsese. So this is not only one of the greatest films ever made, but also I think one of the coolest films ever made in beloved films by audiences around the world. Yeah, in the world of cinema, there are good movies, there are great movies, but then there are those iconic, timeless movies. And this movie is truly iconic and will stand the test of time. And very few movies are like Goodfellas in that way. I think it's the movie that I've watched more than any other film. Whenever it was on TV or we're like, hey, let's put Goodfellas on, you just get sucked into the two and a half hours epicness of this great film. You can't turn it off. Yeah. You cannot turn this movie off. And this film is often in discussion and arguably is one of the greatest films ever made. Whether you like gangster movies, whether you like violent movies or not, you can't deny the masterpiece of filmmaking by Martin Scorsese with this film. 100%. And now, before we get started, if you like our podcast and our content and want to help support us, the best thing you can do is share our podcast, either the YouTube videos or the audio versions on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Podcasts, basically wherever you listen to podcasts, you can find us. We're growing mostly word of mouth, so please let your friends and family know about this show. Leaving those five-star reviews really helps, especially the written ones. Helps us get seen on the podcast apps by new viewers. Um, Hit the notification bell on YouTube. Subscribe and leave a comment. We also have a Patreon now, and you can check us out there and support us monthly. Our top-tier patrons get a monthly shout-out. So thank you, Riley McDonald, Caleb Fleming, Justin Andrew Sullivan, Michael Karanja, become a top tier patron to get a shout out every month too and be immortalized on the podcast. We love you guys. Other than that, let's begin. And as always, spoilers are abound, but if you have not seen this movie, you are living under a rock. Where the hell have you been? I know, for, <laughs> for real. 25-year-old movie that's iconic and come on. <laughs> so Goodfellas is about the true story of gangster turned FBI informant Henry Hill and his life in the mob covering his relationship with his wife Karen Hill and mob partners Jimmy Conway and Tommy DeVito and the Italian-American crime syndicate of the Lucchesi family. And all names, except for police officers and, and uh, public officials, have been changed in this film slightly, besides Henry Hill, of course. There's actually even a, a district att- attorney who, que- who talks to them at the end of the film who actually plays himself and carried out the same exact scene he did with Henry Hill. Oh, is it really him? Yeah, it's really him. When they're asking that, about the, the witness protection yeah, the program? DA, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's the no real idea. guy. That's crazy. Yeah. So they kept it to... They kept it as uh, close to reality as possible, but also had to change the names for libel reasons. And obviously, you know, this is a true account, which is one of the reasons why people love it so much. And it's so interesting and fascinating. But of course, I'm sure some of it's been sensationalized and mm. Hollywoodized. And, you know, Henry Hill was the mobster and he helped wrote, write the book with Pileggi. And I, I know I've, I've read articles where like higher up gangsters and members in the family say he was kind of just like a middle tier kind of guy. Maybe not as important as he portrays himself on film, but who knows whose side is true and whose side is correct really in that, in that sense. But honestly, I actually like that aspect of it. And I think that's why it works better because it's not like something like the Godfather where we're following the heads of a family. We're, we're following the Don with the, with Goodfellas. We're, we're following kind of like the middle level gangsters. They're not in charge. They're not made guys. And they're kind of like the, the soldiers of the army. And it, I think it's uh, a more fascinating take on the mobster movie. Because they're just like us. Yeah. These guys are hyper-violent. They're killers. They're robbers. But they're just like us. Uh-huh. And we'll discuss that later on. The, the realism that's brought to these characters through their dialogue. And, and they're just their day-to-day lives. And you learn that they're just like us, their job is being a gangster. They go home to their family every night. They go to bed. And, you know, instead of getting fired from their job, they get murdered if they if they fuck up well that's with henry hill's narration that's what we learn is the the most appealing aspect to him about being a gangster is that he doesn't want to work a nine to five he doesn't want to take the bus to work he doesn't want to get a shitty paycheck every week he wants to be free he thinks that anyone who works a normal job and is in with the societal norms of the of the world is a sucker and he'd rather die than be someone like that but being a gangster gives him total freedom to do whatever he wants and live as live however he sees fit for himself and so I think the freedom of being able to do whatever the hell you want is the most uh, attractive quality to being a gangster for these guys. Yeah, it's the lifestyle, which we'll get into. But I want to talk about what makes Goodfellas such a great movie. Mm. And the first answer is the easy answer, Scorsese. Martin Scorsese may go down in history at some point as the greatest filmmaker to ever live. 
Um, and Goodfellas is like his Sistine Chapel. It's one of his masterpieces. It's probably his most beloved film by all audiences. It's arguably his best movie. How, somehow he didn't win Best Director. He lost to Kevin Costner for um, Dances with, with Wolves. wolves it's somehow, ama- it's amazing. Goodfellas only won one Academy Award just, just for Joe Pesci. Yeah, isn't that insane? It's absolutely ins- it's it's nuts. And um, a lot of people kind of have this general stigma of Scorsese. They think like, oh, he just does the same kind of movies. He just makes gangster movies. He does the same thing every time. Scorsese has made more non-gangster movies than gangster movies, but, you know, he operates very well in that gangster category. And, um, I mean, he's made movies like like Hugo. It's a children's <laughs> movie. Like, the guy does everything. He made the best sports movie ever. Yeah, so he does not only operate in the gangster genre. But the thing is, he he's, so, he's such a, a natural storyteller in this world because it's the world he comes from. I think that Goodfellas is probably his most personal film. Because he says the city, the city that he grew up in in New York, if you were a, if you were a man, you could do two things. You could either be a, a priest or be a gangster. That's the neighborhood he grew, he grew up in. That's the world he knows. And so a film like this is him. This is a, as, as close to his life as he can get. And the character of Henry Hill, especially growing up in that similar neighborhood, is just like how Marty grew up. So he's able to draw from his own ex- personal experiences in the world that he knows more than anyone else to be able to create such an authentic uh, piece of filmmaking for something like Goodfellas. Yeah, you can say that he was the only person who could direct this movie. He was meant to direct this movie. Mm. Like you said, he grew up in Little Italy in New York. He didn't play many sports. Um, he had health issues. He had asthma problems. So he didn't like do things with the other kids. So he was basically a constant observer of his neighborhood, of his surroundings, being around that culture of that like gangster lifestyle mm. of the Italians in Little Italy. And Marty himself is is a lot like Henry Hill when we we talk when we when he shows you Henry Hill's youth, you know, looking out the window, looking at those gangsters across the street, dreaming of being one of them, trying to get out of that crappy neighborhood somehow and figuring a way out. So so Marty is a lot like Henry Hill in this movie as a young kid. That you mentioned that window shot, I think that Henry is also just like us because you can't help it, but there is some sign, some kind of appealing and attractive nature to being a gangster or a criminal because they do whatever they want, and we all have an attraction and a desire for, to some extent, for, for money, for power, for sex, for freedom. And so just like Henry Hill, as a teenager, watches the gangsters through his window, we're watching the gangsters through the screen of the film. So we're just like Henry, where we're attracted to... There's, in crime movies and criminals have always been major players in the world of cinema, and some of our favorite characters are criminals, so there's an alluring nature to being a criminal. And a lot of people can relate to the character of Henry Hill, you know, that lifestyle of, like, your second, third-generation Italian, Irish, whatever you are. We're third-generation Irish, Italian, um, Americans, so, like, we grew up in, like, those crappy, poor neighborhoods, big family, not enough room in the apartment, <laughs> trying to figure out how you're going to get out of here. Everyone in the neighborhood's like, how are we going to get out of this fucking neighborhood? <laughs> and you're just looking at other people who have success. So a lot of people can relate to this. You know, you have that tough dad who's working 24-7 to put food on the table. Your mother's taking care of the kids at home. So it's a very relatable character at, in his youth. For me, that exactly translated to me growing up where I thought Goodfellas was, like, the coolest thing. And I remember my MySpace page, I had a bunch of Goodfellas posters <laughs> and photos from my MySpace page background. Oh, my God. I obliterated <laughs> my MySpace off the face of the earth as soon as I could, like, six years ago. I did not want anyone to ever see what that looked like, <laughs> ever. Holy crap. You, you, you Gen Z kids listening, MySpace was an absolute disaster. It was, like, the first, like, big social media platform that people were using to project their personalities. Oh, and it was, it was a nightmare. People was- were posting everything on there hysterical you think it's bad on instagram holy crap (laughs) (laughs) but um getting back to marty i think that the strength of this film is because marty's made some incredibly beautifully shot films and with this film you have other gangster epics kind of like the godfather where it's incredibly well made and lit and shot and it's just a beautiful piece of art whereas with goodfellas he could have done that but instead in order to bring it, the realism to the audience and to make it feel more tangible and authentic, he brought a realistic uh, approach to the filmmaking where he makes you feel like you're in the scenes with the characters. A lot of long takes, a lot of tracking cameras. The cameras are oftentimes moving through environments, steady cam, and he, make, he really puts you in the seat of these gangsters 
and he filmed it as though it were like a, a documentary photographing what these guys are doing every day. Yeah, Scorsese's an auteur. We've used that term before. And it basically means like a very artistic director whose vision supersedes the film. Basically, he's, he's like, the, or she and the auteur is basically like now the author of the film, not just the director. And Scorsese has a very unique style, which he throws throughout this entire film with his, his quick zooms, his freeze frames. His freeze frames are all over this movie, which mm. he doesn't use in every film he does. But when he uses them in Goodfellas... He uses them at very important beats of the film, very important beats for the characters. It's probably the best use of freeze frame ever. Yeah, absolutely. And when you watch this film, there's just something different about it. You know, everything about it is a masterclass in filmmaking, the storytelling, the, the writing, the, the characters, set design, wardrobe, acting. It's hilarious. The dialogue is realistic. And I absolutely adore everything about it. I think uh, another strength of this film is its energy. I feel like it's one of the most energetic films ever made. It's so fast paced. There are so many scenes. Think about how many scenes are in this movie. There's gonna be like 200 scenes. Dude, right in my notes, I was like, yeah. "Oh my god, it's gonna take like seven hours." <laughs> and he he shoot the film. He shot the film really quickly. He shot through the scenes as fast as he could to fit in as much coverage of all these moments as he could. And the script um, was originally supposed to be a traditional film showing the the rise of Henry Hill, and the score says he changed it to make it all these cuts back and forth between time periods in order to create this high energy, which keeps you wrapped in because it's a long movie, but it feels like it flies by. Yeah, the structure of the film's interesting. It starts somewhere like near the middle of Henry Hill's story and his life and his mm. full-fledged being a gangster. Yeah. And then it bounces back to his youth uh, back in time. And then it cuts back to back in his full form uh, state of being a gangster and his yeah. life pers after that. Yeah. Which is, I think, one of the greatest, if not the greatest opening scene in a movie ever. Which is, and it starts out with the three of them are driving in a car, and we don't really know what's happening. It's just a, kind of like a, a, a simple scene. Henry, Tommy, and Jimmy. Yeah, the three of them is going to happen. And then the camera pushes in on the trunk, and there's more pounding. And then they open it, and Billy Bats is in there. He's tied up. He's bloodied, and he's begging for his life. And then Tommy and Jimmy quickly kill him. And then Henry Hill takes the trunk and closes it. And then he there's that first freeze frame, and they're all bathed in that red light, which shows like the evil nature of gangsters. And... He says that iconic line, as far back as I remember, I always wanted to be a gangster. And then it cuts to the credits, and it's such a great way to pull you into the movie. Yeah, it's a brilliant way to open the film because right away, Scorsese's showing you what this movie is about yeah. and what you're in for. If you don't like violence, if you don't like gangster movies, you're not going to want to watch this movie. You're probably not going to like it that much. And of course, even that opening shot is very stylized, like you mm -hmm. said, like the pouring of the red light and then that quick zoom in on, on the push in on Henry Hill, the freeze frame on his face, yeah. and then the first line of voiceover which is one of the most iconic lines in film, easily, mm -hmm. where as far back as I can remember, I've always wanted to be a gangster. And voiceover is a huge part of this movie and this script. And it had been, you know, not uncommon to use voiceover in films, but a lot of people don't use it very effectively. And Scorsese at the time, he wasn't a stranger to voiceover. We had it in Taxi Driver. But um, voiceover is mainly used as an uh, exposition tool. And a lot of movies get it wrong. They may overuse it to the extent that oftentimes they're just voiceovering information that has no relevance to the plot or story mm, but like when you blade runner <laughs> yeah like blade runner it's questionable the original if you want if you like the, vo the voiceover there's actually a version with no voiceover yeah, it's actually better cut, yeah and um when used correctly like in goodfellas or even in like fight club voiceover enhances the film enhances the storytelling to a new level and some people think it's lazy i don't think it's lazy at all especially Ray Liotta's voiceover as Henry Hill makes you feel like you're part of the story, like you're part of his life. And it's almost like you're reading the book and watching the movie at the same time. Yeah, and this is probably my favorite use of, of narration because Ray Liotta made it feel like it was conversational. And it's not just a, a boring narration. It feels like he's just he's like telling the story to us in a room. And the way they achieved this is they, they went about it with the untraditional means where when Leota recorded the, the dialogue for the narration, he had a friend of his sit in the room with him, and he spoke the narration to his friend, and that gave it this feeling and tone that he was like telling a story to someone in the room, and that conversational tone makes it really shows itself in the film, and it feels like he's telling us the story personally. And the benefit of the voiceover in a film like Goodfellas is, is it humanizes Henry Hill to the audience. You know, it's important... Because the film is about very bad people. These are robbers, murderers, killers, thieves. They beat their wives. They beat their kids. 
but Henry Hill's voiceover helps you feel emotionally connected to them and make them feel like normal people. And, you know, even throughout the film, when people are getting hit, you're, you kind of feel bad for them. Like when, when Tommy gets taken out, you're like, oh, my God, I can't believe they took out Tommy because you grow to love Tommy despite his, his crazy mentality. <laughs> but these people are gangsters, yes, but they're just like us. Their job is being a gangster. And the voiceover helps bring them down. We also get voiceover from Karen, Henry Hill's uh, wife in the film as well. Yeah, the only other person that has voiceover in the film. I think that the reason why we care about these characters is also Marty's take on the on the gangsters and being able to show us relatable scenes with them. And yet these are despicable and horrible people, yet they're presented in such a way that we like and love and adore them. Like when Karen's talking about the gangster lifestyle and how like their family, you know, they, they do birthday parties together. They go yeah. on vacation together. There's you know? that photo set of yeah, them the photo, all partying. The and, photo yeah. montage of the Polaroids and yeah. the old photos. It's like looking through a family album. So yeah. you feel like you're part of a family. Exactly. And they all feel like a part of the family. And a lot of the dialogue in this film was improvised from the original script. Not on set, but during rehearsals. And this, this movie sort of introduces us to like that talkative gangster. Like, like Joe Pesci is Tommy. Doesn't shut the fuck up in this movie. <laughs> and you love it. And the thing with wise guys and Italians in general is we can never shut the fuck up. So, like, every girlfriend I've ever had has tuned me out at some point while I go on my ridiculous rants about God knows what in the car. I tune you out, too. <laughs> but Scorsese and, and uh, Pileggi, they had enough pride in themselves and their story to let the actors figure out new sorts of dialogue for the film. Mm. And, again, they don't do it on camera on set with, with improvisation. They figure out improvised dialogue uh, in rehearsals, and then Scorsese and Pileggi rewrite the script for the next for those shoots. So it's not like a Judd Ap- Apatow movie or a Will Ferrell movie where they're just on camera spitballing lines. It's very rehearsed and very choreographed. Yeah, and I think this film has the most famous improvised scene ever. And it's not like it came up on the spot, but Tommy's funny house scene. And what happened was they didn't even rehearse this. Joe Pesci told the story to Scorsese before they started filming. He told this story about how when he was a waiter in a restaurant, he told a gangster who was there dining that he was funny, and there was a similar interaction with this gangster where the gangster terrified him and ended up joking. And so Joe Pesci told the story to Scorsese, and there he was like, "Okay, we gotta put this in, in the in the movie, but we're not gonna rehearse it. You and Leo, you and Ray Liotta know the lines and what you're gonna do, but the rest of the cast in the scene are gonna be totally unaware of what's gonna happen." And so that's why the reactions are so authentic in that scene because only Joe Pesci and Liotta knew about that scene. It's one of the best scenes in the movie. Yeah. And Scorsese chose to shoot it like very simply, like a couple, mm. cl- like a close up on Tommy and then like a wide of the table yeah. and a close up on Henry. And that's it. That's those are the only like basically three shots of the whole entire scene because he wanted to make you feel like you're there. And it's the first time you see that scene, you're laughing your fucking ass off. And I still laugh every time I watch it. But also you're terrified because you know Tommy is a crazy killer. And it gets to the point where, like, is he joking or is he actually going to kill? Is he actually going to kill Henry for making fun of him? And he, he plays it so well, where he he looks like he's seriously offended. He's like, "Get the fuck out of here, <laughs> Tommy!" <laughs> Funny how, like, like I'm, I'm a, a clown, clown like, like I'm a news you. <laughs> <laughs> that's what happens when you're a twin. I think that's uh, easily the most quotable line in the movie. This movie is full of great dialogue and great lines, and and we still quote this movie all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Karen, Karen. <laughs> well, you think the- you're Frankie Valley? <laughs> well, that's why we love the movie so much because it's fun and it's so quotable, and we love these characters and we love these moments. I think I don't think there's ever been a film to even come close to to even comparing to what this film did. And the characters in this movie are some of the best you'll ever see in a film because. Every single character in this movie is so well made, so well crafted and unique and so memorable that every time you watch it for days, you'll be thinking about it. You'll be running the dialogue in your head. You'll be running the scenes in your head. Hmm. Even the people who are on camera for three seconds, like Jimmy Two Times, you still think of Jimmy Two Times. I'm going to get the papers, get the papers. It's insane. (laughs) Everyone's memorable and you can remember everybody on screen. And that's one of the biggest strengths of this film are are the characters. Hmm. 100%. And this film also sparked an influence the golden age of television with shows like The Sopranos, Mad Men, The Wire. These were all shows that were heavily influenced from Goodfellas. Even on Sopranos, you have a bunch of actors who were in Goodfellas mm-hmm. made appearances in Sopranos, which we'll get to in a little bit. Yeah, and this could be one of the ultimate depictions of, uh, of masculinity with power, aggression, violence, anger, strength, loyalty, honor, and also a, a fantastic depiction of Italian culture in the 50s and 60s. 
Yeah, if you're Italian American or Irish American or both, like we're half Italian, half Irish, so we we're like basically Henry Hill minus the beating people to, <laughs> with a gun to their face. But like you can relate to the the culture of this film. Marty does a great job bringing the Italian American culture to audiences, even the Jewish American culture to audiences with with the parties and the weddings and the food, the dinners and the the, the clothing, the the style, everything about it. Yeah, exact. For example, um, the thing about the sauce in prison that that wasn't in the book. But Scorsese, being an Italian American, he knows how important the sauce is to the family. So that's why, especially during the cocaine sequence, when his brother's stirring the sauce, like that's what we grew up. Like our mother or our grandmother would be cooking the sauce all day, stirring the sauce. And if they had to run an errand, they'd be like, "Hey, keep an eye on the sauce. Stir it. Every, stir the sauce." Yeah. Every like, time Mom made a sauce, she'd be doing a thousand things at once. Yeah. We'd be playing fucking Game Boy on the couch. <laughs> and then she'd be running errands, making the uh, making the sauce, making the meatballs, simmering the meatballs in the sauce, putting the meat in there, and making us making a stir it every twenty minutes when she went out. And it's, she'd be like, "Don't steal a meatball while I'm gone." Yeah. I, would, I would always try to steal a meatball when I was in charge of stirring the sauce. Who doesn't steal a meatball out of the pot? <laughs> Sorry, mom. We always stole meatballs. Always but, stole the meatballs. But I love. Uh, it's a really cool f- uh, little anecdote. Is that in the prison scene, the the older gangster who's making the sauce and he puts too many onions in the sauce. Like, don't too, don't put too many onions in the sauce. It's still a very good sauce. Still a very good sauce. That's actually Scorsese's father. Is it really? Who, who plays that older gangster? Oh, I don't know because I know his mother's in the movie. Yeah, his yeah. mother plays Tommy's mother. Yeah. So his his dad plays that gangster who ends up being part of the the crew that kills Tommy in, near the end. He's also in that scene. He's one of the gangsters there that that shoots Tommy. No way. And so yeah, and so and then his mother plays Tommy's mom, who's hysterical in that scene where they after they kill after they kill Billy Bats and they they stop by her house and she makes him Italian dinner. Yeah, and <laughs> it's so funny. Yeah, we'll get to those scenes later on. I don't want to jump ahead, but but those are iconic scenes. Yeah, and we'll move on to that in a little bit. But the next thing before we get into the full movie is. The final thing I want to talk about th- about this movie is is the plot. Mm. And there's really no plot to this movie, not like some integral goal. It's really just a film about the lives of Henry Hill and Karen Hill and they're 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 the characters that we go to bed with that night and we spend the days with. They're they're the we have the intimate relationships with really them. We don't go home with anyone else and we're a part of their story and their life. This movie is about what it's like to be in the mafia, the good and the bad. And like most stories, the beginning is full of good, and throughout the, the rest of the film, it's full of bad. Mm. And this even translated in the music, where in the first half of the film, the music is very positive and, and upbeat and, and romantic, romantic and, and, and nice. And then that gets changed to the music tone gets a little darker. He chooses more hard rock songs near the latter half of the film to really translate that emotion. And speaking of music, I think this is probably the best use of music of popular songs in a movie ever done. Yes, because as he is iconic and probably one of the best at selecting music for his films, which we've talked about him and like mm-hmm. Tarantino are up there. And if you're ever cooking or preparing food of any kind, put on Goodfellas soundtrack immediately. Like the first 15 tracks yeah. are insane. It's perfect. A blend of Italian songs, 50s doo-wop. We got 60s soul music, even 70s classic rock like Eric Clapton, The Stones, Cream. And there are 43 songs total in this film. And, and, and producers say that Scorsese had all of these pl- uh, songs already planned out and thought ahead of time for the film. Yeah, three he, years before filming. Yeah, three years before. And he knew where he wanted to use them in each scene. And he actually was going to make this movie, but was also in the process of getting Last Temptation of Christ made. And the money came in for Last Temptation first. So he put this on hiatus for a couple of years, made Last Temptation, and then came back to this. So he actually spent years developing this film before he actually made it. So the main character of the film is Henry Hill, uh, which was a star-making role for Ray Liotta, who was really mostly mostly doing TV shows at the time. He was beginning to break into film, like Scorsese saw him on Field of Dreams and thought he was amazing in that. And, in uh, a Jonathan Demme movie, too. Yeah, um, and Henry Hill might be the most likable character in the film, based off the real-life Henry Hill, who went to the Witness Protection Program, then out of his arrogance left it. <laughs> Goodfellas follows his life and his telling of the story of being in the Lucchesi family, uh, Harry Henry is half Irish, half Italian, so he'll never be able to be a made man, unlike a character like Tommy, who's full Italian and his bloodline can be traced back to the old country. And the Italian mob changed this rule in 2000, giving the ability for someone to be made if they're a part Irish as long as they had a father of Italian descent. And they have to have an Italian last name. 
because they understand, you know, the inbreeding of cultures. It's going to happen. Yeah. You know, we're all living in America. It's inevitable. We're half Italian, half Irish. So I you, mean, how rare is it to find a full Italian person? Like, what is this, the wizarding world? You're trying to only have pure bloods? Like, come on. <laughs> Slytherin over here? You're like, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> and Ray Liotta is great as Henry Hill. Kind of like because he's, like, meant to direct this movie. He's, like, meant to be Henry Hill. And mm. Ray's a very much, like, natural and instinctual actor. He didn't grow up wanting to pursue acting. He took classes when he went to the University of Miami, and he became hooked on it. And he's, like, full of confidence as a, as a human being and as an actor. And he brought this, like, raw emotional talent and performance to Henry Hill. Yeah, and I think that he's perfect for Henry because when you see him in other roles, it still feels like, hey, it's, it's Henry Hill. Yeah, for sure. So I feel like <laughs> just, just uh, Ray Liotta's personal... Ray Liana's r- real life personality really fit this film perfectly. He's kind of a typecast kind of guy. Yeah. You know, he's he's great at what he does. And not that he's not good in other movies that have nothing to do with gangsters and crime, but you know, he's great in that realm in that yeah. world. And then the real Henry Henry Hill is actually this arrogant guy who loves attention and loves power, even much so much so that after the film came out, he started bragging who he about who he was even though he was still in witness protection, he was bragging about who he was posting about it all over the place, and it got so bad that the feds kicked him out of the witness protection program. He was only in it for four years. Yeah. The guy lasted four years, and he couldn't keep his fucking mouth shut yeah. because he thought he was hot shit. Yeah, that's, so it's it's perfectly translated in this film because Henry, even though we love him, he is very arrogant, and he only thinks about himself. He's a pretty selfish guy. Yeah. In the beginning of the film, uh, it follows Henry Hill and how he got into the life of the local gangsters and the mobsters. Mm-hmm. You know, his family uh, lived across the street from the cab stand where he used to work. And he was easily the coolest kid in the neighborhood, working for the local gangsters, parking cars and doing little jobs and yeah. getting shown respect by adults and even in kids in the neighborhood. And I love the quick transformation that Scorsese does of Henry Hill, where he does that freeze frame from when he gets pinched. And then they cut to the airport and like fully grown adult version Henry Hill with Tommy looking cool as hell, leaning against that car with the song Rags to Riches playing. And I love it. I love seeing Henry go from kid to the full form mafiosa. Yeah, it's a great shot. It starts with their with their perfectly polished shoes and pans up and we can see how, how nice their outfits are. And then they both just have that awesome, cool pose. I love Henry's childhood. And it shows this what Martin Scorsese probably dealt with as a kid. And Henry... Because of his desire to become a gangster, he develops two families. He has his blood family, his father and his mother and his, and his siblings, and then he has his mafia family. And as he's growing older, he, he has to make a choice of which family he's going to end up uh, being a part of, and he ends up choosing the mafia family. It's a very seductive lifestyle, yeah. and you can understand why he wants to do that. Like we talked about earlier, like a lot of kids in neighborhoods like that, and a lot of people are trying to figure out how the hell am I going to get out of here, yeah. and that's my ticket to become a gangster. Yeah, and I, and Henry Henry learns uh, a few very important lessons in his teens, which shape who he ends up becoming as a gangster. And the first one, I think, is uh, that scene where his father beats him. And it's an intense scene because it's because he was found out about skipping school. And then his father's whipping him with a belt, and then Scorsese does the freeze frame, and then we have that that narration with Henry Hill. And in this moment, this is where Henry learns that there are serious consequences for his actions when he when he does things that are bad. But then he also decides sometimes you gotta get your ass beat because he doesn't care. He'd rather still carry out these these bad actions and, and he'll deal with the punishment however it comes. So this is a choice he makes where even though he gets punished, he still wants to do the bad things. But being a gangster and the gangster lifestyle solves his problems. Yeah. It solves that problem. They they approach the, the mailman and tell him if they ever deliver mail from the school to his house again, they'll kill them. Yeah. And then like that, the mailman never delivers mail again to the house. Yeah, it's hilarious. And that's another lesson where he learns that using force and violence can get you what you want and can get other people to bend to your will. So he learns the, the importance of power and violence but he, yeah. and intimidation, which is a main tool for the mob. And he also learns about the enthralling nature of respect. Mm-hmm. You know, he gets to skip the line in front of everybody at the bakery. Yeah. People are carrying his mother's groceries home for, yeah. him, for her, and he's only a teenager, barely. Mm-hmm. It's just that sign of respect in the, the way people treat him is alluring as hell, and he wants what the gangsters have. Yeah, and then he learns. he also learns the power of money. For that scene when he meets Jimmy for the first time in the big poker room. And um, at this point, Henry is still just a a very low-level part of the crew. And he's pretty much a waiter for all the the gangsters, making them drinks and bringing them to them at the tables. 
and he meets Jimmy Conway, and Jimmy Conway asks him for a drink, and he brings it over to him, and Conway gives him a $20 bill. And then we also see that shot where Conway is tipping every guy that, that, that is serving him in some way. And so Henry learns that having money can give you a lot of power and give you uh, the ability to get people to do things for you. The cool thing about that scene is De Niro wanted to use real money for that scene, so he used his own money, and so the prop master would give him $5,000 of his own cash when, every time they shot the scene. And then at the end of the scene, they had to stop production and make sure all the money was accounted for. Yeah, he said that the fake money didn't feel right in his hands because he's so obsessive about being the attention to detail in his films. Oh, yeah, we'll talk about that in a little bit too. And then, uh, obviously, the, the final lesson and most important lesson is loyalty, where after he go goes to his court court hearing and he, he doesn't snitch, he comes out and all the gangsters are celebrating. It's like a graduation, and Jimmy tells him the most important lesson, never rat on your friends and always keep, and your, mouth always shut. keep your mouth shut. So, Which is a foreshadow for the end of the film. Yeah, so he, these important lessons through his teens— shape him to become the gangster he eventually becomes. Yeah, I think there are two transformative moments in Henry Hill's life throughout this movie, and the first one being the be getting pinched as a kid and mm -hmm. not ratting, and then the other one is the the big the Air France heist where he makes a ton of money, and he's a young gangster. He's like in his 20s, in his early 20s, and that's also a very transformative moment for him too because he makes all this money. Nobody gets hurt. It's a very smart plan. And, you know, even when he's paying tribute to Paul, you can see how proud Paul is for of him mm. because this is kind of like another major step. You know, he, he took his first pinch like a man, then he first and then he handled his first heist like a man. Mm. And so those are like two very formative steps for creating himself as a as a as a legit gangster. Yeah, exactly. And the real Henry Hill said that the money he got paid for uh, consulting on Goodfellas was chump change compared to what he used to pull in every week as a gangster. Yeah, he got like half a million for for the book and for Goodfellas, and I think he he said he was pulling like anywhere from fifteen to forty thousand a week yeah. as a gangster, which is absolutely absurd. It's crazy. But the thing with with being a gangster and like having all that money is you kind of got to spend it, and you mm. understand why like Henry Hill and all these gangsters they they make all this crazy amount of money, but they got to spend it because you don't want someone knowing that you have a million dollars buried in your, yeah. in your backyard. So like it's kind of like part of the lifestyle think i think where you got to spend all this fucking cash because people are going to come up for you either the feds or other gangsters they're trying to get that money too yeah 100 percent. and then uh, as an adult henry is mainly defined by the woman in his life in a way he can very much be a protector but not, then also he can hurt the woman in his life so for example he beats the crap out of that guy who who was uh harassing karen the pistol whip the, scene. the pistol whip scene which is one of my favorite scenes when he goes, he goes to Karen's house, and then he, the guy and his friends are across the street, and he just walks over with, and he walks over to them, and they're like, oh, you want to fight? He pulls out a pistol and starts bashing it into the guy's face over and over and over again. And Scorsese never cuts it, and then he walks back to Karen and hands her the bloody gun, one of my favorite scenes. But also, so he can be a defender of his woman, but then also their marriage falls into disillusion because of his infidelity, because he can be verbally abusive. So, And then also with his mistresses, he's a, a kind protector and lover to Janice where he beats the crap out of her boss. But then with Sandy, he gets her hooked on cocaine, destroys her life, and gets her locked into his drug ring. But then like we said earlier, Henry loves being a gangster because he loves being free. He doesn't want to be told what to do. He doesn't want to live by rules. He doesn't want to live by societal norms. And so this is why he enjoys being a gangster. Yeah, the lifestyle is addictive to him, and yeah. he's, he's in love with it. Mm. And when he loses the lifestyle and the film decays and the mafia decays, that's when everything sh hits the fan. But then that's defined by the fact that after he's indicted and arrested and he gets into the witness protection program, and it, the film ends with that great shot where he picks up the paper, and he's he there's a narration saying that he's just like an, one of us now he's got a stupid boring life works a job and he feels like he's like trapped in this in this prison of his new life and then even when he closes the door they score says he put the sound effect of a, a prison door being closed yeah so it's he's like trapped in his own prison now because he can't be a gangster and he can't be free anymore yeah the final shot is henry looking back into the camera he's breaking the fourth wall with the voiceover talking about how he's a nobody now, you know, mm -hmm. he has to he asked for spaghetti and he got uh, noodles with with ketchup or something like that. Yeah. And uh, there's that quick cut of Tommy shooting a gun into the camera, and then we cut back to Henry, who 
smiles, like does like a, a weak smile and walks back into his house and closes the door. And to me, that last shot is Tommy is a, is a metaphor of, of Henry Hill's dead. He's mm-hmm. been killed. Not literally, but his his life is over. The gangster Henry Hill yeah, has been gangster killed. Gangster Henry Hill is over. Well, not anymore because he comes out of the witness protection program. Yeah, and you know he's he's some random nobody in some random town in Ohio now. And that shot, the Joe Pesci shooting in the camera, is actually a reference to uh, an, of one of the very earliest uh, feature films called The Great Train Robbery, and it was made in early 1900s. And the film ends with a shot of a cowboy, an outlaw, firing into the screen right at the audience. And this was a, a cause film was still so, so young and early. It's like that, that famous train train sequence where the train drove into the, into the screen where audiences, when they, when they saw this shot of the outlaw shooting at them, they were terrified that they were going to get shot for a moment. And so this is a reference to that same scene in that film, the great train robbery. And Henry basically throughout the film, which we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit becomes his, his own downfall, his greed, his desperation to to make money after he gets out of prison, working with the drugs, his drug addiction, it all leads to his downfall, his falling out with the Lucchesi family, his falling out with Jimmy, his falling out with, with Paulie. He, he's, he's his own worst enemy, and in order to protect himself, he betrays all his friends. Yeah, he breaks the one rule that Jimmy told him. Never, never rat on your yeah, friends. Yeah, don't rat on your friends. So, And that leads to that amazing moment in the courtroom near the end of the film where Henry breaks the fourth wall and starts talking to us. He's on trial. Then he starts talking to us, gets off the court, gets off the stand, and just starts approaching us. And it's this amazing moment because Henry is talking to us finally, not the narration talking to us. Henry Hill in the movie is talking to us because now he's become one of us. He's not a gangster anymore. He's leaving that behind, and he's he's and he's joining joining normal society. And so that's why he breaks the fourth wall. And those of you unaware, breaking the fourth wall. It means that the character or the actor is addressing the camera directly and speaking to the camera or looking into the camera. And it happens a few times in this movie. Hmm. And it's uh, the fourth wall is basically a rule that you know you never break in film. Hmm. You, you Only very few directors will use it effectively. And in this film, it's a great weapon that Scorsese holds on to until the very near end of the movie. And like you said, it's, it's super effective to the audience. You know, you're, you're finally talking to Henry Hill himself after listening to him tell you this story. Mm. And it's like this one minute scene in the courthouse with the empty courthouse and Ray, Ray Liotta just like goes over to you and starts talking to you. It's, it's <laughs> so cool. Now I want to talk about Tommy. Let's get on. That's cool with you. Played by Joe Pesci. He won the Oscar for Best Supporting Actor in this film. The only Oscar for the movie in general. Giving one of the shortest acceptance speeches in history just saying... It was my privilege. Thank you. I had one, though. He yeah. was amazing in this movie. And Tommy starts off as very charming and confident and, and ruthless at the same time. He's a gangster and the life of the party wherever he goes. He also is totally unpredictable. He's a hothead. He has a temper. And throughout the film, Tommy's temper gets worse and worse, and he becomes more out of control until basically every conversation the guy's in ends up in a fight. And he gets he gets the, the crew into a lot of trouble a few times. Yeah. And according to Henry Hill, the real-life Henry Hill, um, Joe Pesci's portrayal of Tommy was 90 to 99% spot on accurate with one exception. Uh, the real Tommy, his name was Do- Tommy DeSimone was massively built. He said, yeah, so he was physically int- intimidating in person, but I think that Tommy in this film, he's driven by intense insecurity because of his size, because of the sound of his voice. And so growing up with the size and voice problem has made him want to constantly prove his masculinity around other people. So this is why whenever he's offended by someone, he lashes out, which is why he kills Spider. When Spider tells him to go fuck himself, he just shoots him because he offended him and made him feel small. So Tommy, Tommy's reaction of being so insecure is to kill the kid. Yeah, Tommy has this weird like little rivalry with Spider, played by Michael Imperioli. Tommy shoots Spider in the foot after he's like making him dance because he's being an asshole. Yeah. And, um... <clears throat> And then the next card night, the next game, uh, Spider tells him to go fuck himself. And all the, everyone else thinks it's hilarious. And Jimmy even like, hey, Spider, this is like, for you. He's like, what's the world coming to? You're going to let him get away <laughs> with that? You're not going to do anything? And then Tommy just unloads on him. And then everyone's like, what the fuck's wrong with you, psycho? And yeah. the, my favorite line in the movie, Tommy's like, what? I'm a good shot. I'm a good shot. <laughs> <laughs> it's fucking hysterical. You dig the grave. You think it's the first grave I dug? I'll take the it, fucking grave. It's the first hole I've dug? Come on. <laughs> and for any Sopranos fans, in season one, obviously Michael Imperioli is in Sopranos. He plays Christopher. 
and he plays Spider as well in Goodfellas. And in season one, Christopher shoots a pastry clerk in the foot in an episode, and then he yells, it happens, as a reference <laughs> to his character in Goodfellas. It's freaking hilarious. If you've watched The Sopranos, you know what I'm talking about. That's so funny. But also, Michael Imperioli, in that scene, after after Tommy shoots him, they have a special effect of uh, blood splattering on his chest. And so that little prop explodes on his chest. And then in one of the takes, Imperioli um, smashed a couple of the bottles and actually cut his hand open on one of the glasses. It was, a, it was a deep cut, so he had to be rushed to the hospital. And when they brought him into the hospital, the doctors and medics were like, oh, my God, he has a gunshot wound on his chest. <laughs> so they, they went to start treating his chest wound. And then he's like, oh, it's just a prop. It's a movie prop. It's not real. <laughs> and they were like, oh. Then, then, then they had him wait in line for like three hours to get his stitches on his hand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there are a ton of actors from Goodfellas in The Sopranos and the creator of, of Sopranos. Obviously, he calls Goodfellas like his Quran. It's like his, uh. his Bible. But so t Tommy has such deep insecurities, and that's why he has moments like that. That's why he kills Billy Bats because Billy Bats is making fun of him and reminding him of, of when he used to shine shoes. And so Tommy is such a loose cannon and always is and is always out to prove that he's the toughest guy, that he's the craziest guy, that he's the last guy you want to mess with because he's so small and because of his voice. Yeah, the Billy Bats killing, uh, where Billy Bats is busting Tommy's chops, is... It's major sort of plot in the film, even though there's like no full plot, because again, there's no central story really. It's about their lives, but this direct you could, you could say it's part of Tommy's plot. Yeah, it's Tommy's plot, but yeah. it also directly reflects from the very opening sh shot of the movie. The opening mm -hmm. scene is related to Tommy Bats because I mean, Billy, Billy Bats because the first time you see this movie, you have no idea who this guy in the trunk is, who they just kill. Mm -hmm. Then you learn it's Billy Bats, and Billy Bats is a made guy, which means he has immunity. You can't touch him. And the only way to take out a, a made guy is to get proper uh, um, authority from the top of the chain. And a uh, made man's in a distinguished position in the mafia. But Billy Bats knows Tommy from his youth when he was just a kid, when he was shining shoes. Get your shine box. And he's busting <laughs> his chops because this movie, like Italians and wise guys, all they fucking do is bust each other chops. Mm. We've gotten in like three arguments during this podcast, which we've cut out. All we do is break balls, man. <laughs> And so Tommy, being the hut the hothead that he is, overreacts and he kills Billy Bats at Henry's bar by beating him to death and then breaking a gun on his face. I had never seen that in a movie where someone beats someone so hard with a gun that the gun freaking breaks off his head. And he says that great line, "I didn't want to get blood on your floor." Yeah. Well, or at least they think they kill him. And then and then from here we have like one of the funniest scenes in the film, which we touched on earlier, where the trio with Billy Bats in the trunk of the car go to Tommy's mother's house to pick up a knife and a shovel <laughs> and played by his mother's played by Scorsese's mother. And the way he shot this, he didn't tell his mother about the what was really going on in the scene. He didn't say that they came with a, a body in the trunk. They just came for dinner. And so, obviously, this sweet Italian mother hasn't seen her son Tommy in, in weeks, so she wants to cook them dinner. <laughs> and Tommy and Jimmy are acting like they didn't, they just didn't kill a guy. And, like, obviously, <laughs> Henry's, joking around, Henry's yeah. like, it might be his first hit, if it seems like. It's the first time Henry's been involved in killing someone. Yeah, so he's kind of quiet, and he can't believe what he just did. And they're all kind of just, Jimmy and Tommy are just laughing their asses off. And then Ms. Cassese's mother, Tommy's mother, bring, shows them the painting of the dog <laughs> and, the, and the guy looking. <laughs> I love it. One dog's looking one way, one dog's looking the other way <laughs> and Tommy's like kind of looks like somebody we know <laughs> without the beard no, no. <laughs> they're talking about the guy in the fucking trunk <laughs> and it's hilarious and uh, an interesting thing about the scene if you watch it again in case you didn't pick up on it because Jimmy's Irish he's eating an Irish meal he's using ketchup on his food yeah and also uh, Joe Pesci improvised the line about his mother asks why he needs a big butcher's knife. He's like, oh, I, we, we hit a deer. I got to get the hoof off the grill. He, he improvised that line. <laughs> and also, when you look at the painting of the two dogs looking opposite ways, that could pretty much be related to Henry and the two paths he could have chosen in life. One path looking one way is the path of like a normal life and being a, an upstanding citizen and a normal guy. And the other path is being a gangster and a criminal. In that painting, I'm pretty sure it was a real painting that – the real Tommy's mother painted, or like the real Henry Hill's mother painted. Uh, the writer's mother painted. Okay, the Pelugi. oh, Pelugi's. Oh, yeah. yeah. So Pelugi's mother painted that. Yeah, but I love that scene. It's so funny because they're, his mom's being so sweet, and she she's like, "Why don't you get married? Why don't you she's settle like, down?" He's like, "I'm married to you. <laughs> I have a different girl every night. Then I come home and I come, and I'm married to you." But again, <laughs> the Italian culture is is prominent in this scene. It doesn't seem like it's an important thing in terms of culture wise, but 
This is big on Italians eating food, and making dinner, no matter what time of day. If you haven't seen your, if you go to your grandmother's house and you're Italian, you are eating pasta. She's feeding you, no yeah. matter what. Yeah. Even if you just like entered a food eating competition and just ate 18 pies, she's gonna make you some pasta. She'll There's like nothing force you, you to, do about it, and she'll force you to. She'll be like, sit down, sit down. I'll have it ready soon. Have some bread. <laughs> I, I, dude, our grandmother used to make us eat like eight plates of spaghetti every time. You we couldn't went over leave the any house. leftovers. Oh my god, you left the house looking like a blimp every time. <laughs> But this this kind of plot point of killing Billy Bats, it's kind of hidden throughout the rest of the film. Like it really doesn't bring, get brought up until later on when Tommy gets taken out, mm-hmm. and that's kind of like the genius of it. Is it's it's like real life. You make these decisions and these mistakes in your life, and you can kind of sweep them under the rug for a short period of time. But at some point, that demon's gonna come out of the closet, just like how you totally forget about Billy Bats. Like they talk about it once in a while. Like Paulie's like, you hear about what happened to that guy? Mm. You, you know the guy I'm talking about. Yeah. But other than that, it's never touched on until well, well, Jimmy- it, it is touched on again when they what happens is uh, uh, contractors, they're going to build some kind of building on that property on those grounds. So then they have to find the body of Billy Bats, dig it up again and then bury it somewhere else. Oh, that scene where they're digging it up. And again, yeah. Jimmy and Tommy like don't give a fuck in Henry's puke. Yeah. And, it's and so Tommy's funny. like, look at this. You want a wing? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. But then Tommy's loose cannon nature and unpredictability and anger are what lead to his demise when he is eventually hit by the mob for killing Billy Bats. Even though Tommy's this hothead wild card and he does terrible things, you still like him. He's mm-hmm. still cool and, yeah. and you're, you, you feel for the guy. And when he gets taken out, you're shocked and you can't believe it because even though he's an asshole and a scumbag, you're like, I love Tommy. Yeah. I can't believe they just killed him. And they, you, they, he makes him personal because before the hit, he's with his mom and his mom's fixing his tie. And he's like, she, his mom's like, I'm so proud of you. And he's like a little nervous. And it's like he's like getting promoted for a job that he earned. You know yeah. what I mean? He's so you, you're, you're, you're rooting for him to get made. And then it leads to that great scene where they bring him into the. <laughs> and this is a really emotional scene for, for Jimmy and Henry when they find out because if when Tommy was going to get made, basically they were going to get made. Because they're part of his crew. Yeah, and yeah. so like we said earlier, you can't get made if you got – at the time, you couldn't get made if you were, weren't full Italian. And it was very important for them. And obviously, Jimmy's also a killer and a ruthless human being, but him and Tommy were best friends. And to watch his, to hear his friend get killed and they can't do anything about it, you know, it's totally justified yeah. in the mafia. I mean, mafia, despite what they do, they have a, a list of codes and – and morals that they live by, and they and when you enter the family, you have to f- obey those rules, mm. and they can't do anything about it. It's justified, and you that emotional break pseudo father figure relationship to both Tommy and Henry because they were kids when when uh, they met Jimmy and then we were starting to pull jobs for Jimmy, like selling cigarettes, and so he was kind of like a, a father figure to both of them in a way. Yeah, I know uh, Pesci and and. Ray Liotta were like, Ray was in his 30s, and Pesci, I think, was like 40, 41. Even though he played a 23-year-old. Yeah, they played 20-year-olds. Like, Henry Hill and Tommy DeVito are in their 20s. Uh, so, I mean, obviously, they don't look that young on camera. Uh, Henry, I mean, uh, Liotta kind of can pull it off a little bit, but they're young guys compared to Jimmy, and they looked up to Jimmy. Yeah. And that's why Jimmy's obviously aging faster with the gray hair and everything. Mm. And this movie is hysterical, and Tommy has some of the best dialogue in this film, which we've touched on, and... He'll make you laugh your ass off, but also terrify you at the same time. And I really love his character, and it's just so fun to watch. And Joe Pesci, it's his best performance easily in his entire career. Yeah, it's, he's defined by this performance, and he, he helps make the movie more energetic and more fun. But let's get on to Jimmy Conway, played by the legendary Robert De Niro. Easily, like, the coolest character in the film. Every guy who watches this movie wants to be Jimmy Conway, Jimmy is an Irish American, so he can never be a made guy. He's not Italian, but he has no problem working with the Italians. Uh, Jimmy's kind of high up in the mob, despite being Irish, and he's a valuable asset to Paulie and the Lucchesi family. Mm. And unlike the hothead Tommy, yeah, Jimmy has a temper, but he's more controlled, more poised. He's a professional. He does lose his temper from time to time, like when people wrong him, for example, when Maury won't pay him and when the crew at the airport job starts spending the money, when he tells them not to spend any of the money, and he starts taking them out after the heist <laughs> and keeps all the money for himself. So he's more r- calm with his temper than Tommy, who just has outbursts. Yeah, this is one of De Niro's most iconic roles, and he actually got top billing 
because of who he is, even though he, he probably has less scenes than both of them. De Niro is so obsessed with authenticity when he plays a real-life character like this person, where he, was, he had the real Henry Hill on speed dial on his phone. He would call him seven to eight times every single day to ask Henry Hill about various random things about Jimmy, how he smoked a cigarette, how he put ketchup on his food, how he dressed. He brought so much authenticity to the performance of J- Jimmy Conway. Yeah, and, and also De Niro's very specific about his wardrobe and, and specifically we've talked about his shoes on, on characters. And every single one of um, Jimmy's outfits was accompanied with a specific watch and a specific pinky ring. Mm. Like that's how into the character he gets and how much he wants to be authentic. And they almost put this in the film, but uh, the real-life Jimmy Conway was actually, both he and Henry Hill were involved with uh, a point-shaving scheme with the Boston College basketball team. So they paid the basketball players from BC to shave points off their games so that they could bet on the games and make tons of money. Al Pacino was also offered the role of Jimmy Conway, but he turned it down due to fears of typecasting. And then he ended up being big boy Caprice and Dick Tracy, which <laughs> is basically, really yeah. so he obviously admits that, that decision. Chino's <laughs> turned down a lot of uh, roles from Scorsese, and obviously this one is one of the best roles De Niro ever did, so it's definitely a mistake he made in his career. This is the role that, after he did this, everyone thought of De Niro as like the ultimate tough guy. He's like a natural gangster because he does it so well, and Jimmy Conway is like a definitive gangster. When you think of a gangster... You think of Jimmy Conway. And he's also involved in one of my favorite shots in the entire film is that cream shot. And then Jimmy's just taking rips of his cigarette. And you can just see in his eyes, like, I'm going to fucking kill this guy. He's doing that near look, yeah. yeah. It's probably the best use of music in the film. And when Henry meets Jimmy, we talked about earlier when he's a kid, Jimmy is like a rock star to him. He's a rock star to a lot of young gangsters coming up because he's already a well-known guy. He's established in the mob. He's always got cash. He's giving everybody at the casino night a twenty dollar bill, a hundred dollar bill. Even the even the person who opens the door for him gets twenty dollar twenty dollar bill. So Jimmy's a, basically a rock star, and like we said earlier, he's a father figure to Henry throughout the film. And Jimmy, even though he kills sometimes when he has to, his real thing is robbing. Jimmy loves to rob. He loves to steal. He gets a kick out of it, and it shows that when he robs the eighteen wheeler early on the film to show an introduction to him. He tips the the driver of the of the eighteen wheeler some money, as just for his troubles. <laughs> and so, like we talked about earlier, Henry was having uh, an affair with Janice and had his, her own apartment. And after we have that crazy scene with Karen pulling the gun on Henry and them having their wild fight, and then Henry hides out at Janice's apartment. Jimmy and Polly go to convince Henry to go back home because Jimmy understands how the mob works. He's he's like Polly. He's he's a professional. And they understand that if there's a, a, a bad divorce between this couple, who knows what Karen could say. Mm. So he's also a very respected person, even to Henry at this point, even though they're almost partners to yeah. some extent. They don't want to have to kill Karen because they will have to kill Karen if it ends up kill, continuing on this path. And, and, and they're a family, you know what I mean? And to, to take Henry's mind off of everything, uh, him and Jimmy go do a job in Tampa where they try to feed a guy <laughs> to the Tigers. <laughs> And rough him up. <laughs> Such and a great scene. This is uh, an important scene because it leads to both of their arrest for this crime because the sister of the guy that they threatened to feed to the Tigers was like a secretary at FBI, and she told them everything. Mm. And even the brother got arrested and went to jail. Yeah. And obviously, Jimmy and Henry go to prison at um, different areas. They serve different prisons. Yeah. And uh, Henry has the great time to serve with Polly and everything. We have those great scenes of them cooking dinner and stuff. Mm. Yeah, prison, prison for mobsters is like not even that bad. Like... There's that scene where they're preparing dinner and they he pulls out lobsters out of a out of a box filled with ice and they're drinking wine and so like being a mafia guy being a wise guy in prison you kind of still get to you, you're in prison but you get to enjoy it you get to eat well you get to have anything brought into the prison that you want and it's it's not that bad yeah they run the place in yeah. prison this is where we'll dive back to Henry for a second mm. this is where Henry gets a taste for the lucrative profits of drug dealing. And drugs are what eventually leads to the downfall of several of the main characters in this film, as well as Polly Cicero, who didn't even want anything to do with it. Mm. Um, and this is something that majorly doomed a lot of mafia families in general, too, was going to the drug industry. But when Henry gets out of prison, 
Pauly tells him, I understand what you did in jail with the drugs, but I don't want anything to do with it. No drugs at all. But obviously, Henry, he just got out of jail. He's got a family to feed. He's got to get them out of an apartment. So he ropes uh, Jimmy and Tommy into his new drug enterprise, which were like the new scam, very lucrative, but also very high risk. And Pauly doesn't want anything to do with it because it jeopardizes the entire family if they're drugs related. This actually is a, a critical part of the Godfather film where Don Corleone doesn't want his family doing anything with drugs. And then he rejects the offer from that other mobster to partner up in the drug business. And that leads to his um, assassination attempt on Don Corleone's life. So the Italian mob, there are people who had different perspectives on drugs. A lot of the older traditional guys didn't want anything to do with it because they knew it led to, it was a high risk. Being pinched was a very easy thing. So the older guys didn't want anything to do with it. But then the younger blood, they wanted to make as much money as they could. And they saw that drugs were the easiest way to make, as, to make this money. And I'll do that. After Henry and Jimmy get out of prison, Jimmy orchestrates this brilliant heist. I think it was the the most lucrative robbery in American history. Yeah. I think it might still be. Yeah, it might but still be. They stole five point million, five point eight million dollars from an airport. I think it was called the Lusfana job or the Lusfana yeah. robbery. And it doesn't sound like a, m- a lot right now, but for inflation, this is the '60s. So if you inflate it, that's like thirty million. And so he pulls it off, and there's that awesome scene of Henry Hill in the shower listening to the the news <laughs> report of it. He's like, Jimmy. You did it! You motherfuckers, you motherfuckers <laughs> Jimmy! <laughs> and it's hilarious and it's super fun. And then the next shot is them celebrating at that restaurant. It's Christmas time. Yeah. There's a Christmas song playing. Rudolph's playing uh, at the bar. No, Frosty Snowman. Oh, Frosty Snowman's playing yeah. at the bar. But also we get another sense of Jimmy's ruthlessness where all his, his crew members on the job are coming in with one of them's got fur coats on. One of them shows up with a brand new Cadillac. And Jimmy specifically told them not to spend any of the money. No lavish expenses because he didn't want to draw attention to themselves. And this is what leads to Jimmy in that epic scene, this montage of all these mobsters and like even some of the mobsters' wives are getting hit. Some people are found in garbage trucks. Some people are found shot in the head in their in their cars. Yeah. It's because Jimmy... Not only does he want to selfishly keep all the money for himself, he's also protecting himself from getting pinched. He became extremely paranoid and lost um, control of his of himself, and and he ended up de- believing that nobody could be trusted. And that paranoia also seeps into Henry and Karen later on throughout the film. And it gets to the point where Henry and Karen are so terrified of Jimmy that they think he's going to kill them as well. And it leads to that amazing scene where Karen went to see Jimmy to talk to him at his warehouse. And then after after they have their conversation, Jimmy tells her, hey, I got some new coats out back. Go check them out. Take as many as you want. And then there's that great scene where Karen goes outside of the warehouse and then and she needs to go like um, probably like 100 feet further to enter the area where the where the coats are. And then she takes a few steps and then she it's like the dark alley and she she gets terrified. And then she looks back and then Jimmy's standing in the doorway. He's like, yep, back there. Just, Just go back there. And she's like back there, and he's like, "Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yeah, right back there." And she gets so terrified and paranoid that she ends up taking off and, and running away because she thinks he, she's gonna get killed right there in that moment. I, I know, I love that scene because you feel the paranoia too. And yeah. at this time, this is when Henry and Karen are really getting into the drugs, and mm-hmm. they're starting to get attention from the feds. Yeah, and Jimmy was involved with the drugs, and he doesn't want Polly to find out that he was involved with the drugs because if. Polly finds out that Jimmy is involved with the drugs. Jimmy's probably going to get taken out because mm. Polly wants nothing to do with the drugs. Yeah. So is is Jimmy trying to take out Karen and Henry to save himself because they're the only two people who can tie him to the drug ring? Yeah, I think Jimmy Conway is interested in self-preservation. Yeah, but personally, I don't think Jimmy was going to have Karen killed right here or have Henry killed because if Jimmy Conway wanted to kill them, he would have killed them. And he showed that with his ability to just kill people with no remorse plenty of times already. And I honestly, I don't think that he was gonna kill Karen. I think I think that Jimmy was gonna was planning to kill both of them. And then there's that diner scene with um, Jimmy and Henry. And throughout the conversation, Henry realizes that Jimmy's probably gonna kill them. And they have and Scorsese does that away from the the table while they're zooming in with the lens, so it, it crushes the background and expands it. And that that's a moment where Henry finally understands. That he's gonna get killed by Jimmy if he doesn't do something yeah, soon. Yeah, maybe, probably, yeah. but also, which you is have why to, he ends up ratting on him. But you also have to factor in the paranoia. Yeah, but but then you know the paranoia of Henry Hill and his wife Karen 
we have to rat on these people or else we're going to get killed. Henry and Karen are making a ton of money. They seem to be kind of like on top of the world again. They have a brand new house. They have Maury over and they show him like the, the wall that opens up to the TV. So they mm. have all this cash again. And it seems like it's everything's going to go great. But eventually they start attracting attention to themselves and they develop they develop drug problems themselves. They're addicted to cocaine and the feds start to come on to them. And, and obviously there's that great sequence the helicopter sequence where Henry it's like a day in the life of Henry Hill yeah. that Scorsese takes you on and it's just a paranoia trip filled adventure of I'm gonna get pinched <laughs> and I'm scared shitless yeah and it's it's basically him and Karen running errands like trying to sell guns to Jimmy trying to pick some drugs up um, him going to get new mixes of, of cocaine from from Sandy and all the while, his brother is stirring the sauce the whole time back at home. He's making the chicken cutlets, yeah, too. <laughs> that's, that's the best way to make chicken cutlets, yeah, so by he's, the way. So Henry's juggling all this shit in this one day. And then throughout the entire film, Scorsese films it with long takes, very slow-paced filmmaking to really bring you into the moments. But with this entire sequence, very fast cuts. The editing is whip, whip fast. And it makes you feel paranoid just like him and Karen. And they're constantly like looking up at the sky at the helicopter. And you're like, is that helicopter following us? Been, I feel like it's following me everywhere. <laughs> yeah. And also like the music we have, I think he's playing like the Rolling Stones, Monkey Man. Like, There's a few the songs. Monkey. Yeah. So it's very, very high beat music, very heavy drums the whole time. And so he makes you feel like exactly how Henry's feeling, like kind of, kind of paranoid, high strung and uh, bewildered. And he's also dealing with his runner. So is he yeah. has this plane runner who runs drugs on, on flights and she uses um a baby as cover uh, mm -hmm. and and with a diaper bag and that's how she smuggles the drugs on planes across cities and her inability after henry asks her to use a different <laughs> phone than the house phone she uses the house phone which eventually leads to his arrest at the end of that day when he's in the car mm. in the driveway then all the feds pull up on him and that's when henry gets pinched for real and he says, as soon as I heard the guy talking, I knew uh, it wasn't a gangster because the gangster would have killed him without saying anything. Yeah. So let's, let's sidetrack to Karen for a bit because she's involved with Henry's drug ring. But her transformation as a character is pretty fascinating because she starts out just as like a, a, a normal woman and then gets thrown into this mob life. But she's, she was just as intoxicated as Henry with with the mob life because she puts up with his infidelity. She puts up with his verbal abuse and physical abuse because just like him, she loves this lifestyle. It's very much like Camilla and the Sopranos, big yeah. time. So Karen is played by Lorraine Bracco, who also had a major role in the Sopranos. She plays Tony's therapist, one of the top build ca actors in that show. And this is obviously a very male-heavy cast, and Karen's role was very important be for that reason. They had to get it right and... In order to make Karen stand out as an integral character to the film, Lorraine Bracco brought so much energy and charisma to Karen, and she's one of the best parts of the movies. Mm. And Karen was born into a nice Jewish family, no mafia ties, and for quite some time in their relationship, Karen has no idea what Henry does before they're married. He lies to her, tells her he's a union delegate, and it's not really until after Henry, which you talked about earlier, when he beats the neighbor in the face with the handgun, and he gives her the gun to hide, that's when she realizes who this man is and what she's gotten herself into, and she's turned on by it, and she's enthralled by the lifestyle, just like the lifestyle seduced Henry. Hmm. It seduced Karen as well. She's sedu seduced by the cash, the connections, the no rules, being able to do whatever he wants, and the ultimate seduction in this film that Scorsese used to show this of both parties is that infamous Copacabana long take. And so this iconic steady cam long take where they go through the bottom floor of the Copacabana, through the kitchen, through the hallways, and we see that Henry is so connected that he can get into the most popular club in America through the back door, and then they, he, they, when they enter the restaurant, they, hand, they, they grab a table and carry it through the restaurant and put a table down for him. So they make a table just for Henry. Through the front of the restaurant for this scene, and they were forced to go in the back. So Scorsese had to kind of think on his feet, and being the genius that he is, he came up with this iconic, probably the most iconic long take in film history. Hmm. And the thing with this scene, like we said, it's the ultimate form of seduction for this date with Karen, but also the lifestyle of being a gangster with all those perks and knowing everybody getting the tables made without reservation, getting the bottle of champagne sent to you, like you just said, that's also seduction for Henry. Mm. And also, this is a contrast to their first date. So on the first date, 
Henry was being a wingman for Tommy because Tommy was trying to trying to sleep with this Jewish girl. Jude brought it. It's prejudice against Italian. In can this you, day and age. In this day and age. Can you believe it? <laughs> and so he was uh, being a reluctant wingman, and Karen was the other the other woman at the date for the double date. He had to meet Tootie. Yeah. <laughs> and then he, he had no interest in, in Karen at all. And then on the second date, he stood her up. He didn't even show up for the second double date. And then Tommy's like eating food. He's like, I don't know what happened. He said he really liked you. <laughs> 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 but then Karen makes Tommy find Henry and she just calls him out in front of all his guys. And then she's being very, she's showing a lot of power and strength in this moment. And that's when Henry finally becomes attracted to her. He wasn't attracted to her at first because she's like just this nice Jewish girl who has nothing to do with the mob and she just doesn't seem very interesting. But then when she shows her true side to Henry in that moment, he's completely enthralled by her. And that's what draws him to her. And so throughout the film, Karen goes through, like you said, this crazy transformation similar to Henry. She gets involved with the drugs. She gets involved with the drug ring despite throughout the beginning of the film. She's, you know, just part of the family. She's trying to do the the mob housewife thing with all the other mob housewives because the thing with being in the mob, those are the only people you can interact with. And she doesn't really like the other mob wives. And she goes to that, like, that beauty day where they're all putting that blue facial stuff on their face. Yeah, they have crazy hair and yeah, makeup yeah, and nails. Yeah, they shape makeup and, and, and they talk about how they beat their kids. And she seems the most normal of all of them and maybe the most anti-mob wife of them all until she starts getting in with the drugs and she starts becoming addicted to that lifestyle with the money and everything. Yeah, she, she says she doesn't want to be like them, but she ends up being just like them because... When she's first introduced to that group of women, she learns that, like, these women, like, put up with their men f- for their bad behavior. Like, they're always cheating on them, and they're always assholes, and they're – because they're gangsters. And then she's like, I'll, we'll, we'll, I'll never be like that. Our marriage will never be like that. But she ends up putting up with a lot of shit from Henry, and she ends up becoming just like them. And there's that great scene where – Henry's in jail and Karen's visiting and she can't take it anymore and no one's helping her out. Paulie's not helping her out and she's just like pulling all this stuff out of her bag. <laughs> she pulls, and out of her out of her. She pulls out a, a loaf of bread like out of her out of her shirt and her jacket. She's got the baby crying. Hmm. It's just ridiculous. And then obviously the guard like is paying no attention to it. Yeah. And it's just like you can see the emotional wreck that she's becoming throughout the film because of everything that Henry's doing to her and all the abuse she's taking physically, emotionally, verbally. It's, it seems like it's a very tough life. It's taking a toll on her, and obviously the, she chose a path in life that could lead to destruction, and it is and it is ruining them. And again, this is very similar to, if you know about Sopranos, if you've seen it, it's very similar to Camillo and Sopranos, where Camilla's like a, a, a devout Catholic. She's a very good person, and she's constantly coping with the fact that her husband does terrible things, leads a terrible life, but she's addicted to the lifestyle, addicted to the money, mm. addicted to the to the no rules, doing whatever you want, anytime you want. Mm. So Henry and Karen are basically forced to go into the witness protection program after the paranoia of there being a hit out on the both of them from Jimmy or Polly. And like we said earlier, Henry does what Jimmy told him never to do. He's going to rat on his friends. And Henry gives up everybody to the feds. He, they clean up shop. Mm. And those courthouse scenes are, are hard to watch because you've really grown to really love these characters. And you're witnessing a man betray all of his friends. He even betrays he betrays Jimmy. Even Pauly gets pinched for this, even though he had nothing to do with the drugs. So you kind of feel bad for Pauly. Yeah, and Pauly had always been so careful in his entire life, never using phones and never getting involved in drugs. Yeah, and the thing with Pauly, he was like once a god to him. And Pauly... He's a he's a he's a criminal, yes, and he's in the mob, but he's he's kind of like a good guy in a sense, you know. He's like a protector of that community. Mm. He's in charge of that community. He makes sure that there's there isn't lawlessness Just between ability. the mob, and he's kind of like they said earlier on in the film that like he's like the police force of the mob. That's what the cops don't understand. They need people like Polly to run everything. And then there's that heartbreaking scene when Henry goes to Polly asking, begging him for help. And then Henry, all Paulie does is he gives him the cash he has in his pocket, and he says, I have to turn my back on you now. Yeah, so it's he, a tragic scene for Henry. Yeah, so basically Henry also, he goes into the witness protection program because Paulie's abandoned him. The Lucchesi family's abandoned him. He's lost all his respect, all his ties to the family, to the mob. He's on his own. He's dead broke. He thinks he's going to get killed, and he's got a family to protect. Yeah, and then it's a heartbreaking scene watching him do that to his friends and his family in, 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 in court. But like we said, he ends up going to witness protection program, and then it leads to that that great ending. But ultimately, obviously, Henry Hill ended up being such a 
a loose cannon that he got out of the witness protection program pretty quickly. Yeah, and uh, he's he passed away, I think, in like 2012 or something like that. Mm. One of the main themes of this film is guilt. Not of crime or sin, but of, of betrayal and betraying your friends and, and ratting on your friends. And again, the first time Henry gets pinched, doesn't say a word, and he's treated like a hero by these mafiosas and his idols. You know, Jimmy grabs him and says that line, never rat on your friends, always keep your mouth shut. And again, it's a perfect foreshadow for where everything is gone, he's in desperation, and so he rats on his film, and he has to deal with that guilt for the rest of his life hmm. and that betrayal. 100%. The, the a fun fact about this movie is the word fuck is used 321 times in this film and at the moment in, in at that moment in time it was the uh, the film that used that word the most in history and now it's been beaten by uh, I think like a dozen films but Joe Pesci says the, the uh, Joe Pesci says fuck half of the times in the movie <laughs> it is all improvised Scorsese draws some criticism from people for his films especially this one and a film like the Wolf of Wall Street because they think that he's glorifying this kind of behavior and this kind of lifestyle. But that's not actually what he's doing. What he's doing is he's telling a story. And in order to properly tell a story about gangsters, you have to be real and authentic and show what their lives are like. And so, yeah, oftentimes they're having fun and, and they're committing crimes and doing horrible things for their own benefit. But that's the only way to be honest about these characters and in order to tell the story properly. But then also... You can't be glorifying this film if they all end up dying or getting arrested and put in prison. So obviously the message is that like one of the messages is that if you're a criminal, you're going to get you're going to end up being destroyed by the end of your life in some way. So yeah. I don't think he glorifies it at all. I think he's just honest. Yeah, we talked about this a lot in the Tarantino episode where if you don't like violent movies, don't watch violent movies. No one's forcing you to watch a movie. If you don't like a movie about drugs, you don't like a movie about gangsters, don't watch a movie about drugs. To watch a movie about gangsters. Yes, it's fun to watch, and they're great movies, but also they're cha they're tough. They're they're not made for kids. This is rated R. You should be adult when you watch this movie. Obviously, we won't always <laughs> watch it. But again, if if it's not for you, just don't watch it. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you should criticize the art of 